Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 46, Apollo Program Flight 9, Apollo 15, Part 1, Orbits Over Hadley. Last time, we wrapped up the last of the H missions, Apollo 14. After a troublesome transposition and docking, and some last-minute radar trouble, Antari set down in the Fra Mauro Highlands, fulfilling the goal of Apollo 13. While all the new gear worked great and some record-breaking EVAs were performed, the mission wasn't quite as successful as some had hoped. The crew was unable to reach the rim of Cone Crater, and since Shepard wasn't all that interested in geology training, some of the samples were a little bit lacking. But hey, the overall mission was a success, and at least we got to play golf on the moon. If Apollo 14 was the last of the H missions, what comes next? The I missions, of course. Right? Actually, those were just rolled into the next type, the J missions. It's been a while since we went over them, so briefly, the mission types were A. Uncrewed test of the Saturn V and command and service module. B. Uncrewed test of the lunar module. C. Piloted test of the CSM, that'd be Apollo 7. D. Piloted test of the CSM and LEM together, Apollo 9. E. High altitude piloted test of the CSM. They just skipped this one because Apollo 8 was so cool it made up its own mission type. F. Piloted test of the CSM and LEM around the moon. Basically a dress rehearsal for the landing. We saw this on Apollo 10. G. The first human landing on the moon. The big moment. Obviously Apollo 11. And H. Precision landings on the moon. We saw this on Apollo 12 and 14. With the J missions, everything got ramped up. They could almost be thought of as a second generation of Apollo hardware, applying all the lessons learned in earlier flights. That might be a little extreme, since really they were the same gear, but everything had been slightly, and sometimes not so slightly, upgraded. Maybe this strut can be a little bit stronger. Maybe this panel can be made a little bit lighter. Maybe this battery can run a little more efficiently. You know, that sort of thing. They would also be flying a riskier trajectory to the moon by having the S-4B inject them into a non-free return trajectory, saving fuel for the SPS. So if they somehow lost all three engines available, they'd be in deep trouble. And deep space, since there'd be no way to get back. The upshot of all this was a far more capable mission. Instead of a 22-hour stay on the lunar surface with a single 2-hour EVA, We're looking at a three-day stay on the lunar surface, with three EVAs approaching eight hours in duration, each. Oh, and did I mention they're getting a car? Because they're totally getting a car. Up until this point, lunar landing missions had been fairly limited in how far the astronauts could stray from the lunar module. Since the only way to get anywhere was to walk, or sort of low-gravity trot, and since they had to carry all of their tools and rock samples, it wasn't easy to get very far away. They also needed to maintain line of sight with the LEM so that they could use its powerful antenna to relay their radios to Earth. If future astronauts were going to explore an area properly, they were going to need a better way to get around. Enter the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or as it's usually known, the LRV, or Lunar Rover, or Moon Buggy. It had a few names. This was a 10-foot-long electric-powered car with seating for two people and bulky spacesuits. It had four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering, and special wire mesh wheels that could better handle lunar dust and running over rocks. Mounted to it was a color TV camera that could be remotely operated from Houston, so now everyone could come along for the ride. For controlling the rover itself, astronauts could steer with a hand controller placed between the two seats. You'd think a flight stick would be sort of a strange input method for a car, but I've actually sort of tried this by tooling around on the surface of various moons in the video game Elite Dangerous. It is weird, but you get used to it pretty quick. To assist in communication with Earth, it carried the Lunar Communications Relay Unit, or LACRU. With a reasonably small package, it was able to relay radio signals directly to Earth, allowing astronauts to wander out of direct line of sight with the LEM. If the thought of wandering across unknown hills out of sight of your only ride home from a giant lifeless rock terrifies you, as it probably should, fear not. As usual, NASA had a solution and the lunar roving vehicle had a slew of instruments and displays to aid in navigating back to the aluminum balloon astronauts called home. 
One of the trickiest aspects of the LRV was that it had to fold up to a ridiculous degree in order to fit into the LEM. If you think way back to my description of the LEM structure in episode 29, you'll know that the descent stage structure is sort of like an octagon with a plus symbol embedded in it. That leads to five squares in the plus symbol and four half squares, called quads, on the corners. The LRV had to fit into one of those quads. So not only did this thing have to carry around two guys, their spacesuits, their tools, their rocks, their antennas, and everything else, all without breaking, but it also had to fold up into an itty-bitty package and be as simple as possible to set up. Oh, and Boeing, the company that won the bid for this device, only had 18 months to prove it would work and build a small fleet of them for upcoming missions and training. No pressure. The LRV would be put through its paces on the most ambitious lunar landing mission to date. Apollo 15 would be exploring the Hadley-Apennine region, which contained a mix of different environments. To the east was the Apennine mountain range, a remnant from a stupendously large impact early on in the moon's history. To the west was the Hadley Rill. Picture a long and windy river nearly a hundred miles long, a mile wide, and a thousand feet deep. Oh, and take all the water out because it's on the moon. Uh, That's Hadley Rill. Scientists speculated that it may have been a collapsed lava tube. Further west was a large open area similar to that explored on Apollo 11, Mare Imbrium. The commander and lunar module pilot would have to approach at a steeper angle than previous missions to ensure that they safely passed over the towering Apennine Mountains, but also make sure that they didn't land past or in Hadley Rill. It was a tricky landing that was only made possible thanks to techniques proven on Apollo 12 and 14. Like the crew of Apollo 14, the crew of Apollo 15 had trained for this mission for quite a long time, While it wasn't made public for a few more months, Deke Slayton had told them privately that they were the 15 Prime crew just a little while after Apollo 12 landed. They were already hard at work training their butts off when Apollo 13 pushed their mission several months to the right. So this was a crew that was definitely ready to fly. Commanding the mission would be someone we're all well familiar with by now, Dave Scott. Scott started his astronaut career alongside Neil Armstrong on the hair-raising flight of Gemini 8, which we covered in episode 18. He returned to orbit as the command module pilot of Apollo 9, which was the first piloted mission to carry the lunar module. You can hear all about that one in episode 34. Across both missions, he had proven that he had what it took to both stay calm in the face of a crisis, as well as learn the intricate maneuvers necessary for orbital rendezvous the perfect candidate for an Apollo commander. This was his third and final spaceflight. Joining Scott on the surface was lunar module pilot Jim Irwin. James Irwin was born on March 17, 1930 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He attended the United States Naval Academy and the University of Michigan, picking up a bachelor's in naval science and a master's in aeronautical engineering and instrumentation engineering in the process. After his education, he joined the Air Force, which sent him to test pilot school, where NASA found him in 1966. He joined the astronaut ranks, alongside 18 of his colleagues, in Astronaut Group 5. In 1991, he would actually go on to earn the dubious distinction of being the first person who had walked on the moon to die. Take care of your hearts, everyone. This was his first and only spaceflight. And flying as command module pilot was Al Warden. Alfred Warden was born on February 7, 1932, in Jackson, Michigan. He grew up on a family farm and very nearly became a farmer himself before deciding that he wanted to expand his horizons a little. He attended West Point and then joined the Air Force to pay off his free tuition. Warden's choice also made this an all-Air Force crew. As an Air Force pilot, he gravitated towards challenging roles that involved a lot of instruments-only flying, and especially enjoyed single-seaters. Sounds perfect for a CMP. He eventually returned to school to earn a master's in aeronautical engineering and instrumentation engineering. He worked his way through a variety of roles in an all-weather squadron and as a test pilot, before being asked by Chuck Yeager himself to come to Edwards to be a test pilot instructor. And that's where NASA found him in 1966. This was his first and only spaceflight. At 9.35 a.m. on July 26, 1971, just over two years since the launch of Apollo 11, the long months and years of training were about to pay off 
as Apollo 15 rumbled off the launch platform. From the astronauts' perspective, the launch was smooth with no issues, but later analysis showed that they encountered a close call. In order to accommodate the significantly higher weight of the J mission, a number of small compromises needed to be made. For example, when the S-4B shut down, the crew were in a slightly lower parking orbit. But another compromise that almost ruined the mission was the removal of a few solid-fueled rockets from the second stage. These small rockets would fire during staging to ensure that the propellants in the second stage were nice and settled at the bottom of the tanks and that there was a safe gap between the first and second stage. It seems that the Saturn V engineers got a little overzealous when removing these small rocket motors and maybe should have left more than they did. The first stage took slightly longer than usual to shut down completely, and the second stage had fewer of these small rockets to push it away. This meant that the first stage nearly rammed the back of the second stage, which would have immediately necessitated an abort. In fact, they were so close that when the second stage lit up, it blasted the first stage badly enough to knock out all telemetry. And this kind of an accident is no joke, it's happened before. The third ever SpaceX flight ended in failure with almost the exact same scenario. And that wouldn't be the only instance of potential, um, let's call it propulsive reconnection. After a successful translunar injection, transposition and docking started. For this mission, the crew had dubbed their command module Endeavour after the ship James Cook sailed on his famous scientific expedition. For the LEM, perhaps as a nod to Apollo 11 and to their new, more nimble spacecraft, they chose Falcon. As Endeavour lined up with Falcon for docking, CMP Al Warden noted that the main engine thrust indicator light was lit. This essentially meant that the SPS engine was ready to fire at any time with just one set of valves keeping the engine restrained. A frantic GNC mission controller set up the command to disconnect the circuit breakers related to engine ignition. There were a few moments there that the SPS could have lit and the CSM would have rammed right through the LEM. I sort of suspect that this would have been a survivable accident, but it certainly would have ended the moon landing and maybe even the other two landing missions. And there is no guarantee that it also wouldn't, you know, kill the crew. For much of the ride out to the moon, the crew would work with mission control to help narrow down the source of the bug. This was important. If it ended up just being a problem with the indicator light or the cockpit switch, then they were good to go. But if the short actually existed in the engine system, they would have to abandon the landing. Thankfully, the issue was eventually traced to a source in one specific switch in the cockpit. By being a little creative about the valve opening sequence, Al Warden was able to essentially use the SPS like normal. Crisis averted, Endeavour moved in and hard docked with Falcon on its first try. With Falcon securely attached, the mission was off to a good start. The next day, it was time to pop open the hatch and inspect the vehicle. What the crew found raised alarm bells in Houston. Somehow, during the ride uphill, the glass covering one of the LEM's many indicators had shattered. That didn't necessarily mean that the instrument itself wasn't functional, and it did eventually work, but it did mean that the LEM was now full of broken glass. What is a nuisance on Earth can be a matter of life and death in space. What if a shard of glass worked its way into a hose and punctured it? What if it drifted into somebody's eye? What if someone inhaled glass dust? There were a lot of really nasty possibilities. I found this incident interesting because it really highlights how a relatively minor problem can escalate in space. The crew got to work gathering up as many glass shards as they could find and using a vacuum hose to suck up as many glass particles as possible. After that, all they could really do was button the hatch back up and hope it didn't impact the mission later. After an otherwise uneventful trek out to our nearest cosmic neighbor, Endeavour and Falcon slipped behind the moon and performed the 6 minute and 40 second long lunar orbit injection burn. Thanks to the higher latitude of the landing site, the spacecraft would have to enter a more inclined orbit than usual. This afforded the crew a close-up view of landscapes never before seen up close by humans. That would especially come in handy when planning the remaining two landing missions. About 98 hours into the mission, Scott and Irwin bade farewell to Warden and climbed aboard Falcon for the long ride down to the surface. Once the initial checkouts were performed and the hatch was secure, Warden flipped the switch to separate and nothing happened. Easy fix though. Warden opened the hatch back up and found a loose umbilical cable, tightened it up, 
put the hatch back, flipped the switch again, and Falcon was free. This is another great example of a moment that seems pretty harmless, but is actually sort of scary. While they had no reason to suspect that this would happen, if the spacecraft decided to separate at that moment after all, Warden would have been launched through the tunnel by all the air rushing out of Endeavor. But that's not what happened, so I guess let's not dwell on it. The minor hiccup hadn't impacted the planned orbit, and Falcon slowly backed away as Warden watched from the window. An hour later, Warden fired up the SPS engine again to recircularize his orbit, which would make rendezvous easier. While Scott and Irwin head down to kick up some dust, we're going to do something a little different this time and hang out in the command module. I often hear people talk about the command module pilot role as if it's some sort of consolation prize. Aw, oh, poor guy, goes all the way to the moon and doesn't even get to walk on the surface. I can see how people get that idea, but it really wasn't like that at all. Would the command module pilot also like to get his boots dirty? Sure, of course. But the CMP role had unique challenges and unique bragging rights. For one thing, compared to the lunar module pilot, the CMP did a lot more actual piloting. They were responsible for keeping the entire vehicle stack on course for the trip to and from the moon. They were responsible for transposition and docking, extracting the LEM from the S-4B. They were responsible for threading the needle and ensuring that the command module hit its re-entry window and didn't burn to a crisp as it did so. And while they were never called upon to do it, they trained extensively for a lot of rendezvous rescue maneuvers. If the LEM had an engine problem and ended up in some wonky orbit, it would be the CMP who would go rescue it. And of course, a rarely spoken reality was that the CMP could always be called upon to return home alone. When the commander and LMP departed for the surface, there was never a guarantee that they would return. And not to dump on the lunar module pilot, but despite the name, they didn't actually pilot the lunar module. Their job was to keep the LEM running smoothly and give the commander the information he needed to pull off a smooth landing. An important and challenging job to be sure, but for men who prided themselves on being hotshot pilots, the CMP was arguably a better role. Okay, so hopefully that sets the record straight a bit when it comes to the command module pilot. But just what the heck did they do up there while the landing crew did its thing? It turns out that the answer is a lot, especially during the J missions. Remember how I mentioned that the I missions were just rolled up into the next mission type? The proposed I-missions took advantage of the fact that there would be a large and capable spacecraft with a trained astronaut in low lunar orbit for several days, and stuffed the service module full of instruments and experiments. Rather than make this a distinct mission type, operating these experiments became part of the CMP's duties during his stay in lunar orbit. As you'll recall, the service module is a large cylindrical structure subdivided into six pi wedge sectors arrayed around a large central tank. One of these bays contains the oxygen tanks we became so familiar with on Apollo 13, but some of the bays were actually empty for the earlier missions. For the J missions, one of these sectors would become the Scientific Instrument Module Bay, or the SIM Bay. The Apollo 15 SIM Bay contained a number of instruments that were designed to slurp up as much scientific data as possible while also enabling landing maneuvers even more daring than scooting over a mountain range. Once the large SIM Bay cover was jettisoned, its instruments could get to work. One instrument was a special camera that continuously exposed a rolling reel of film. This resulted in long, high-resolution strips of imagery covering a 200-mile-long swath of the lunar surface. It was actually the same type of instrument used in early spy satellites, or even the U-2 spy plane. But now we're spying on the moon! These detailed images were useful for planning landing sites, but were also pure gold to geologists. Another camera took a series of photos that were more synoptic and less like a telescope. They wouldn't come back as one long continuous exposure, but since the photos were taken at a regular interval, they could be stitched together. This camera complemented the high-resolution images with wide shots that captured the overall landscape, allowing scientists to see broad features. The cameras were further enhanced by the presence of a laser altimeter, which bounced laser beams off the surface of the moon and recorded the precise altitude of the CSM. By combining the altitude, the time the photo was taken, and the known trajectory of the CSM, scientists would have far more context about the photos. But cameras weren't the only instruments. 
there was also a mass spectrometer positioned at the end of a 25-foot-long boom. This device was essentially able to sniff out any material it encountered and allow scientists to determine what it was made out of. I'm sure they found more than this, but in his biography, Warden noted that a lot of what they found was material emitted from the spacecraft itself, namely rocket exhaust and urine dumps. Yep, we're back to space being gross. Joining the mass spectrometer on another long boom was a gamma ray spectrometer, which would search for radioactive materials. Discovering radioactive regions of the moon could have all sorts of implications about the moon's formation and active geology. All of these devices had to be actively managed by Warden during his solo stay around the moon. The care and feeding of instruments like this is a full-time job and is a great example of how we can take advantage of humans in space. Automating this entire process would be pretty tricky, but with a human at the controls, it was no problem. When systems started to break down after a few days of use, Warden was able to come up with workarounds. Workarounds that would have been difficult or impossible on an automated satellite. When he wasn't managing the large cameras in the sim bay, Warden also took countless photos by hand. He had studied extensively with geologists so that he would be able to quickly read the landscape as he flew over it. Thanks to his training, he was able to notice geologically interesting features and make sure that they were captured for analysis. Warden's three-day solo flight wasn't all monitoring instruments and capturing data, though. Every two hours, he would slip behind the moon and be cut off from all humanity. Not counting the two men on the other side of the moon, over 2,000 miles away, he was completely and utterly alone. When he was in the moon's shadow, he could turn off the CSM lights and bask in an infinite sea of stars that no earthbound eyes would ever see. Every time Endeavor emerged again from behind the moon, he made sure to take a moment to capture the breathtaking sight of the Earth rising over the barren landscape below. He also forged new connections with the Earth. Ahead of the flight, he had written down greetings in 20 different languages and would greet Houston and the whole world in a different one each time contact was reestablished. I really feel like the command module pilot role is underrated by the general public. They hardly ever get a mention most of the time, and when they do, it's usually in the context of being some sort of astro loser, the butt of a joke. Even with Apollo 11, the most famous of the landing missions, Mike Collins is often forgotten. If you want to learn more about the extensive training and fascinating duties of a CMP, check out the book Falling to Earth by Al Warden. It's an easily readable and well-written book that covers the flight in detail. It's also interesting to see the career path of someone who not only didn't really plan on being an astronaut, but wasn't even sure if he wanted to be a pilot. Next time, we'll leave Al Warden to his scientific duties and rejoin the crew of Falcon for landing and exploring the Hadley-Apennine region. We'll see the return of the stand-up EVA, some dynamic driving, and hmm, some anomalous heart signals from Jim Irwin. That can't be great. And as 2017, the first full calendar year of The Space Above Us, wraps up, I want to take a quick opportunity to say thank you once again for listening. Thanks for spreading the word, and thanks for the kind reviews and ratings. I always thought it was sort of hokey when I heard other podcasters say it, but it really is incredible to know you're all out there. If you ever want to reach out and let me know what you like, what you don't like, ask a question, or just say hi, you can reach me via email at jp at thespaceabove.us or via Twitter at at Space Above Us. I dropped the the to save a little room. You can also message me via the show's Facebook page at facebook.com slash thespaceaboveus, but fair warning, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, so I usually only notice new messages when I'm making posts announcing new episodes every other week, so please be patient. Anyway, that's enough for me. And since I don't like ending with just me blathering on about the show itself, here's one more thing. When we get back in two weeks, Al Warden will perform the first ever deep space EVA. Just a person crawling out into the unthinkable void with nothing tethering him but an oxygen hose. Definitely not the stuff of Lovecraftian nightmares or anything. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs>